Okay. Uh, okay. Well, now is the time to introduce the last speaker of the day. And um, for me, it's an honor to introduce you, Jack Hoyhot, uh, who is the chair uh, in the Bernal Institute of the Biomedical Engineering Program at the University of Limerick in Ireland. His research is focused on poromechanics of swelling materials. So for all people that is working in IVD modeling and cartilage modeling, so as a matter of fact, all our research is based on his contribute, so we are really happy to have you here. And also he is a founder of the International Society of Porous Media that actually focus on the use of all these poromechanics, let's say, tools, not only in, bio, um, in the biofield, in also in different areas on the industry and engineering. So welcome, Jab, and thank you very much for being here, and the audience is all yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, it, it's a pleasure for me to be present here on uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, convention and uh, these... Uh, um, this uh, interesting number of people uh, uh, studying the uh, numerical applica applications of numerical methods in uh, clinical applications and biomedical applications. Um, what I am going to do is a little bit different maybe than what some other people have been presenting here, is that I will go into... Um, how to improve the tools that we use in uh, biomedical engineering uh, for numerical simulation um, so that we can increase the reliability of these tools. Um, to give a little bit of an idea where I am, uh, I have a position, a secondary position in Holland, but my main position is in Ireland and is part of the Bernal Institute. And the Bernal Institute is an institute mostly privately funded from donations and from industry, uh, fo focusing, oh, my thing is gone. Yes. What happens? Ah, was a problem with Microsoft PowerPoint. That's not good. What's happening now? Disappeared. No, not new plant. Open. Open recent. Barcelona. Is coming back? Si, si no. Let's see if it remains stable. <laughs> um, so Bernal Institute is a project of about 100 million euro, um, which uh, aims at employing about 400 researchers, uh, mostly funded from uh, donations and from uh, industry, but also a little bit from uh, the uh, government. And um, there are about six or seven chairs there, one of them being biomedical engineering. And uh, a significant part of the research relates to pharma pharmaceutical science, but is, is in fact uh, much broader than this, including material science, molecular biology, and energy technology. Now, as far as what, what I am doing in uh, the institute, I'm focusing basically on two areas. One is intervertebral disc research, and the other one is cardiac mechanics. And uh, both of them are focused on um, having uh, numerical simulation tools in relationship to experimental setups in the lab. And uh, for the intervertebral disc, we cooperate a lot with uh, Christine Lemaitre from Sheffield and Theo Smith from University of Amsterdam. 
uh, the themes that we are researching involve voltage-gated ion channels, piezoelectricity, scoliosis, and finite element analysis of electromechanical coupling in the disk. Uh, apart from that, we have a, a significant uh, line of research in cardiac mechanics, in which we try to fill a serious gap into cardiac mechanics in, order, in, in the sense that we are including coronary perfusion and uh, trying to uh, make a tool which can be used, maybe not for patient-specific problems, but at least to evaluation of cardiac devices. Now, if we look at uh, what happens when we start on finite element analysis of specific organs, such as the intervertebral disc, uh, my experience, and usually that is not very much uh, reported in the literature, my experience is that quite often, because of the complexity of what we are studying, uh, including the fact of heterogeneity of, of the, the domain, the anisotropy, very large deformations, uh, discontinuities like contact or fracture. Uh, quite often, uh, people using uh, standard tools such as abacus or ANSYS or whatever, they get convergence issues. In fact, when we talk with the, uh, the uh, abacus people of what we are doing, they think, oh, that's not, never going to work. <laughs> so, um, obviously, there are publications, nice publications, showing, oh, yes, 3D analysis, and uh, 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 we took uh, ligaments and contact and fracture, etc. And all of this seems to work. But the reality is that the student has been trying and trying and trying and finally found something which works and then publishes it. And doesn't mention that he, he, he checks so many, many times to actually find something which actually converges. So I think if we want to move towards clinical application of finite element analysis, it should be absolutely reliable and stable. And even in uh, uh, very um, uh, challenging areas, such as large deformations, uh, strong heterogeneities where, where the material properties changes orders of magnitude, such as between bone and cartilage. And um, all of these should not be an, obs uh, an obstacle to actually have it running. And uh, so I'm going to talk about what we've been trying to do to improve the situation as it is today. And in trying to do that, we realize that developing finite elements rather than using existing finite elements, when we try to develop finite elements, we have to think across disciplines. We cannot afford to say, oh, we are going to develop specifically for intervertebral disc degeneration a special software which is uh, completely geared to that particular application. It doesn't work because you don't get funding for this. And immediately they expect your clinical applications, some development of, a, of, a, of a, 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 a device or something, and uh, you can't get it funded only on that application. But the reality is that when you think of finite element development, this can have a very broad application. And you'll see that I will discuss not only disk, but also application to gels, and gels in particularly in relationship to diapers, uh, nappies, and um, also in terms of geo geomechanics, there is uh, the equivalent of herniation of a disc, but then uh, known in geomechanics as hydraulic fracturing. All of these different fields, they need to talk with one another to create the finite elements which are reliable and can be used systematically without worrying about the uh, uh, convergence of the equations. So I'm going to touch on this. I'm going to touch on fracture as well. And I'm talking uh, a little bit about perfusion modeling, where we use similar methods which we are used to have in uh, swelling media. So if we think about swelling media, um, you, you can uh, draw many applications, many different applications, in terms of the stiffness of the material 
and in terms of its swelling propensity. And then you see, for instance, sandstone is something very stiff and not swelling at all. If you go uh, down to gels, then you have PVA, which is somewhat swelling, but not so much. P Hema may be a little bit more, and you, you may have uh, ionized uh, gels, which are uh, much more up in the corner there, but cartilage and disc are somewhat swelling and in the order of megapascal stiffness. But if you talk about intracellular space, you're up to kilopascal stiffness and very high pro swelling propensity. And especially in that corner, upper right corner there, we get really into trouble. Why? Because the high, swe high swelling and high deformability makes the, 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 the models and the materials extremely versatile and even sometimes unstable. Now, in this area, it, it, it's not a small area because most of biology happens intra, intracellularly. In cytoskeletons, and uh, nuclei, um, uh, cytoplasm, in those areas, you're down to kilopascal stiffness. And then what you find is that abacus doesn't work. That's, that's the issue. So what to do? And, um, and, and actually, 90% of biology takes place intracellularly. So, Getting funding for intracellular modeling of poro mechanics, forget about it. Um, what you can do is use applications from the industry. And now uh, a, a very famous uh, application, which we all know, is diapers. Diapers are highly swelling. Um, a very efficient uh, product, which uh, all of you who have had children had used a lot. And um, if you go down to what happens inside the diaper, you find small beads of hydrogel, which swell about 30% of their volume, 30 times their own volume. And uh, they're actually surrounded by a, a, some kind of a um, uh, um, uh, cross-linked uh, layer on the outside. And you see, as it is swelling, and this is actually a, a, a bead of this type inside the diaper, when it is uh, faced with a gush of urine, it starts swelling, but before swelling, it has to get this surface shell to crack. And it cracks into pieces, and uh, you, you see it, oh no. What could happen now? It doesn't seem to like it. Let me start again. So that's another example. Uh, oh, we can't see it. Wait a minute. I go in presentation mode. That's the issue to get it done. Now, uh, this is also a small bead of, of such, a, such a diaper. And uh, the small bead is looked upon by a very simple method. You know, many optical methods, you use uh, very advanced uh, uh, optics, etc. Here we did nothing of very advanced optics. We took the, the um, the camera of a uh, mobile phone, you know, uh, you, you take off even the, the lens, lens, you do away from the lens, do away with the lens, and you put the bead straight on the chip, on the chip, the CMOS chips, which uh, observes the, 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 the photos that you take every day with your, with your, your, your mobile phone, and uh, you put it on there, and then you look directly on the uh, uh, particle as it is lying on the chip. And um, so, I hope that this, this is going to work. That's it? 
Okay, it's almost running away, but you you can see very clearly that it um, it, it has what is called the cauliflower effect. So it, it, it swells one side and then the other side, and so it, it's it's a very in in, in uh, non homogeneous uh, swelling of of the phenomenon. So you you see you see surface instabilities coming up, and to to illustrate this even a little bit better. I can show you another uh, uh, video which we've been make, making of a, a gel uh, of a uh, cylindrical form. And uh, you can remove it from uh, high salt concentration to salt con low salt concentration. And then uh, it starts swelling. And um, it starts swelling, but it, it, it develops surface instability, which here you can see very clearly because it, is a, it starts with a cylinder. And um, what happens, in fact, is that the outside swells first and the inside doesn't because it, 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 the water cannot reach inside. And then the kernel and the outer surface needs to remain in contact with one another. And the way it does, it goes into surface instability and later into a kind of saddle shape. So it is convex to upwards in this plane and the plane perpendicular to the picture, it is convex downwards. And, um, and um, the, the, so we have a kind of subtle shape. And progressively, it is swelling. In the meanwhile, the, uh, the uh, ions go out of the gel, and the water goes inside. And they compete, actually, with one another. And at some point, it goes also into the center of our gel. And uh, progressively, then it goes back into the original cylindrical shape. And going back to the cylindrical shape demonstrates that our gel is purely homogeneous. So we have a purely homogeneous gel, but still it goes into those mad shapes. And um, one of the challenges that we took, and particularly in perspective of what is happening inside the diaper, we actually wanted to be able to simulate this. And uh, I must agree that still now we didn't succeed in simulating what is happening here. But uh, we, we got some, some way. And um, now, um, because of the special relevance to biology, uh, considering that 90% of biology happens intracellularly, and uh, we, we, we pay attention to this also from the point of view of biological application. Now, if we look back in time, you, you know I'm working at the Bernal Institute. And Bernal was uh, actually the um, a student from a Nobel Prize winner and also the teacher of two Nobel Prize winners. And uh, he worked on, on, on uh, uh, Proteins, proteins. He was the one, the one person in the world who has been the first to ap to apply uh, crystallography to proteins. And one of the most important things that he concluded is that if we use, you want to analyze the structure of a protein, uh, you need to study it in water because interaction of protein with water is absolutely essential for the structure of the protein themselves and uh, to understanding the protein themselves. So uh, what we use, basically, practically speaking, in order to, to study these gels and intervertebral disk is theory of finite deformation of porous solids. And it's actually a very old theory, because it, it dates back to 1972. And um, on top of that, we use the, uh, the insights from Flory, also some Nobel Prize winner on swelling, which uh, uh, who uh, argued that you need three free energies. One is elastic free, free energy, the, the, the second is mixing free energy, and three is the ionic free energy. Ionic free energy is the one which was responsible for donon osmosis. Many of people working in cartilage and disc know they work with donon osmosis. So uh, this free energy of ions is very, very important. Um, uh, mixing energy is uh, in, in, in disc and cartilage is known under the name of exclusion, uh, exclusion phenomenon and is about responsible for 10% of the swelling in cartilage and disc. Uh, elastic free energy is just the LCT, so that's quite obvious. Now, in terms of gels, 
mixing becomes very important when the gel is, is dry. And uh, increasingly, the ionic part may become important if it is an ionic gel. And as go, swelling goes on, the ionic part becomes more and more important. So we have basically a double layer around every uh, protein or every uh, polymer and uh, negative charges with compensating positive charges in the fluid. And this is basically what generates most of the ionic swelling, namely around the positive charges, there are a lot of water molecules around it. And uh, we can talk about the by length, namely the thickness of that double layer, which becomes more as the outer salt concentration becomes less, and less if the outer salt concentration becomes more. Now, in gels, unlike uh, disc, you can say that uh, ion diffusion coefficient is typically much larger than pressure diffusion coefficient. Why? Because pressure diffusion coefficient is linked to the stiffness, and because the stiffness is so low, you get low pressure diffusion coefficient, much lower than the ion diffusion coefficient. This relationship does not hold for cartilage and disc. Um, so when we can uh, say this, uh, the nice thing about it is that we can say that the ions go immediately in equilibrium and we can forget about all of ion diffusion, co diffusion uh, altogether and we can only focus on this pressure diffusion, what are we exactly going to do, and this leaves us with only a fluid and a solid. And then there are equations, and for those people who are at home with equations, this is uh, 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 momentum balance, this is mass balance, and this is Darcy equation. Flow times permeability is equals to permeability times gradient of chemical potential. And we can write these equations down, and we can try to solve them. And uh, the swelling we account for by means of a ionic uh, component, a mixing component, and an elastic component, and I want to go into the details of these equations. But what you do, if you put it into Abacus or any other uh, standard uh, software, you see that everything goes fine as long as you're around megapascal. Megapascal, it's okay, you, you, you manage because it converges. But as you go down, and typically this happens inside cells, is that uh, 55 kilopascal, you have most are already failed, and 15 kilopascal, you get no answer at all. So you, you get really into trouble uh, down to that uh, level. And not only you get into trouble when you go to low stiffnesses, but you get also trouble when you go into, um, into uh, heterogeneous uh, materials. Uh, you get into trouble when uh, you have strong an anisotropy. Uh, many is issues are created as soon as you get out of the standard uh, uh, range of application. Now, the question is, why is that so? Um, and can we do something about it? Now, the trouble is that you cannot do something about it inside Abacus or inside uh, uh, ANSYS or whatever package, because you have to be able to look inside. And so what we did, we um, first analyzed very carefully why the problem comes up. And the, 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 what we found actually is that one of the key issues here is what is called local violation of mass balance. Local violation of mass balance. Just a very simple experiment. Uh, many of you who have been working on cartilage will know is consolidation experiment, consolidation, confined compression. We have a sample of whatever cartilage or whatever are lying on a filter. We put a piston on it and we push out water. And uh, as we push out water, we uh, get a uh, uh, settling of the cartilage because water is, is, is pushed into the filter. And we can also try to simulate this. Then we have a finite element mesh, uh, a few elements one on top of the other, and we uh, define pressure. And typically, we would assume pressure to be linear inside an element. So we have piecewise linear variation of pressure. And then we derive our flow with Darcy's equation. Uh, flux equals gradient in uh, pressure times permeability. 
and then we get a flow for one element, another flow for second element, another flow for third element. Now you see immediately what is the problem, is that this element pushes out so much fluid, the, according to that red line, into the next element, and the next element only less comes in. And same thing with a jump here across the elements, you have a, a discontinuity. So the flux out of one element is not equal to the next one. And this is not an issue. As long as it is uh, globally accounted for, most of finite elements you can use uh, uh, abacus without any trouble. But um, when you go to very large deformations, you get really into trouble. And so what we do is basically using a trick which is not new at all. It has been used for years in, in, in fluid mechanics. Uh, it's the use of what is called ravia toma elements. Ravia toma elements described in very difficult uh, mathematics uh, books on finite element analysis. And uh, the simplest one uh, which you can think of, which accounts for local mass balance, forces a local mass balance to be true, is one of this type. You have a, in 2D, you simply have a, a square element with on the corners unknown displacement. And you account for the flux through each of the sides, x edges, in a, as degrees of freedom on top of the displacement. So where here we are using pressure, here we are using the fluxes across the edges. And uh, we are going to use that element because this one will be able to force the uh, fluxes from one element into the, el the other element to be same, exactly same. And uh, that's, that's what we do. And uh, we force these two fluxes to be exactly same. And uh, the way we proceed is as follows. If you take now the example of a triangular element, you have the displacements unknown in the corners and three uh, fluxes. And uh, on the top of that, we have one pressure, or in case of swelling, it is a chemical potential in the middle. And we can write down the full equations as we have them from the equations I just show you. Uh, conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, and Darcy's law. And uh, we can solve those equations, but as you see, we have more degrees of freedom than if we had taken pressure simply, because we have those fluxes. And uh, what we do now is enforce these fluxes coming out of one element to be exactly equal to the flux into the other element. So we have two elements next to each other uh, in, in a big mesh. And so we are forcing this Q3 to be equal to Q3 star by being of a Lagrange multiplier. And what we find is that we can add this condition to our set of equations. And then it becomes a really big uh, 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 e equation set with Lagrange multipliers and chemical potential and flux and displacement. And uh, this one will be able to enforce local mass balance. But now we do a further trick, and that's what is called hybridization, where you eliminate the mu and the delta element by element, the, the Q and the mu element by element. And what you're left with is displacement and these Lagrange multipliers. Now, what are the Lagrange multipliers? They are along that uh, those edges. They are basically uh, the uh, pressure in normal polarity or chemical potential if you include the swell. So we use this uh, formulation, and we are going to look at a, a small uh, piece of gel and allow it to swell. And you see, this is what happens. We have tetrahedral elements in 3D. And uh, it can swell to uh, multiple times its own volume. And we get very stable results. And other example, which is maybe even more uh, illustrative, it is, a, it is a, a ring fixed to a fixed surface, uh, uh, brought to swell. And um, um, it goes into surface instability. That's basically what I showed you experimentally. You can, you can go into significant surface instability and very large deformations because of this creasing going on. 
And uh, I can assure you, you will never get this kind of calculation done with abacus. Uh, but it, it is typically what happens if you are down to very low stiffnesses, you get surface instabilities. And uh, this kind of analysis is uh, the one which is happening. And you can actually verify also experimentally that uh, the phenomena that you calculate correspond to what you measure. Uh, you can uh, plot one relative to the other the um, swelling propensity and the stiffness. And then you f get one side of the curve where there is surface instability and the other side where there is no surface instability. And same thing with numerical result, stiffness versus swelling. And one side is instable and the other one is not. So, and now we can go back to our simulation, look at what happens when we take down the stiffness down to 15 kilopascal, and you see that most of our uh, uh, simulation nicely converge. And so this is what we want. We want an absolutely reliable finite element analysis, which can be used routinely without each, each time getting uh, uh, responses, oh, this uh, calculation doesn't work. So uh, uh, going back to the cylinder that I showed you in the beginning of the, calc the, the, the presentation, uh, we can show that as we take it to lower salt concentration, we get swelling, but also surface instability. You see very clearly the surface instability. It's not at all in the order of magnitude that we had experimentally, but um, still there is surface instability, and we are working on uh, getting this even more pronounced at what it is here now. Um, so what happens during that swelling is, uh, in fact, underneath the surface, you have a strong compression building up. A compression, here you have surface effective stress. It goes strongly into the negative before rising up again. And uh, this strongly going into the negative is the source of the surface instability that takes place. Now, Things are kind of complicated also in terms of material properties. Material properties, um, we've done experiments, detailed experiments of this, and uh, MIT has also done experiments on this in, um, in cartilage, is that if you disallow cartilage to swell and change the salt concentration in which, within which it resides, you will find that the cartilage is going to stiffen as the salt concentration goes down. So we usually think of you know, material properties, oh, they depend on strain. You know, stiffness is more on higher strain than lower strain. Now, even if you keep the salt concentration, you keep the deformation absolutely constant, uh, but this time you change the outside salt concentration, then you change basically the thickness of those double layers. So this is the Dubai thickness here in high salt concentration, here low salt concentration. It changes the thickness of the double layer. And part of the stiffness of a gel is related to uh, the thickness of those double layers and not just to strain. Even if you constrain the, the gel and disallow it to swell, you get a stay change in stiffness. And we did actually experiments. Here, this is a gel uh, uh, enclosed from all sides within a torsional uh, tent, uh, testing bench and uh, within, uh, enclosed within a, 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 a ring so that it cannot swell or shrink. But we can change the salt concentration in the bath. And then you find changing stiffness depending on the salt concentration. These are three different salt concentrations, 0.03 molar, 0.1 molar, 1 molar. As you change the salt concentration, even at constant strain, you still get a different stiffness. And uh, so th this kind of result has been found f by us for gels, but by uh, Adam Drodzinski in, in MIT for, for cartilage. Here we have a dependence of stiffness on salt concentration as such. And you see here, she modulus plotted versus ionic strength, and you see quite significant changes in stiffness. 
all of these we can plot, build this into the model so, so as to represent really what is happening in such a gel. And uh, automatically, when you assume these, uh, these shear modules to depend on soil concentration, also electric potential depends on strain, which may be extremely relevant to mechanotransduction as well. Now, a second theme I would like to talk to you about is fracture. And fracture is a phenomenon which is extremely relevant to uh, disk degeneration because most of disk degeneration is associated with fracture. And uh, fracture means that very locally at crack tips there are very large strains even in uh, relatively stiffer uh, environments such as disk or cartilage. And uh, the strains are large and there also we expect uh, local mass balance, balance violation. Um, now, the, di the disc is known to be cracking or tearing uh, as it uh, degenerates, and usually this tearing is not very much associated with loading. It's actually intrinsically associated with aging, swelling, uh, loss of, uh, of uh, fixed charge density because of the degeneration. And um, so this uh, fracture is, uh, on one hand, relevant to biology. On the other hand, finding also funding for this kind of simulation on fracture using uh, uh, coupled to swelling is a difficult one. Now, I showed you in the beginning the gel from the diapers. And you see also there, there was fracture. So we got actually funding through, through Procter & Gamble to do this kind of simulation. And we started on fracture propagation in swelling media. And I will start with an experiment. An experiment, an experiment it relates to a gel. And the nice thing about gel, you can look inside it, which almost you never can do in a solid. But here you can look inside it. And we have them, the, the gel, uh, a piece of gel with a small uh, crack initiated in it, fixed to, uh, to both sides uh, to uh, a drawing bench, the, the, the grips of both sides of the drawing bench, and we're going to move apart one uh, side compared to the other and observe the cracking inside the hydrogel as uh, it propagates. And um, so this is the gel. You see the initiating uh, uh, crack here, and uh, we're moving apart the jaws, and you see that it progressively propagates. And we hope to, it, it to be a one-dimensional phenomenon, but you see how it is a very complex thing happening at the crack tip. And you should think that similar things happening in the disc and to the cartilage. But uh, if you look very carefully, you will see that um, it, it doesn't propagate in a, a, a continuous fashion, but much more in a stepwise fraction. Suddenly it propagates, then stops, it propagates, it stops. And um, we find this even for just uh, strictly homogeneous material. So in gel is it's homogeneous. There is nothing like a, a, a in inhomogeneity. And if you look at the surface, you find that there are uh, actually teeth along it, which also indicates that it is stepwise progression. And um, so we also could show that the distance between the teeth uh, depend on the Young's modulus. You did many, many of these experiments. And you see that Young's modulus, as Young's modulus increases, you get a longer distance that it propagates each time between the steps. And the time it pauses does the opposite. It, uh, it is higher for low, low Young's modulus and uh, lower for high Young's modulus. So, interesting finding, but uh, we tried that also to simulate this. And you say, well, we use XFEM. XFEM is an advanced method of finite elements, well known, to do fracture propagation. And people in concrete and in steel, etc., they use it. Uh, but we wanted to use it for poro mechanics. And so, this is a crack inside a poro mechanical medium. And the XFEM, nice thing about XFEM, you don't need to do remeshing. You just do enriching of nodes. 
you do as you propagate through the, 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 the mesh, you actually progressively enrich nodes as you go through the finite element analysis. And uh, so you get at some point a whole path followed by the, um, the finite element uh, method and uh, in progressive enrichment of all the nodes which are tainted in black here. And um, what you basically do is using the same thing as regular finite elements, using displacement degrees of freedom and pressure degrees of freedom, but you enrich the displacement and you enrich the pressure by means of an extra uh, discontinuous shape function. And um, this is very standard stuff. Only uh, what we did, we did, uh, uh, ar along the crack, we had pressure defined inside the crack, but also a pressure defined on the left side of the crack and on the right side of the crack. We had three pressures in each point. Because uh, the thing is, that we, uh, we expect these three pressures to be systematically different inside gels. And um, so we allow fluid to flow from the crack into the formation, into the, the gel, and from the, within the gel, it is flowing as well because it's porous, me porous, me porous media, and also uh, within the crack it is flowing. So these three things are accounted for, and also there we, uh, we, we got funding from, again, another source. And um, hydraulic fracturing is a very important thing in oil industry. And so also there we use uh, fracture. And uh, this, this is a simulation of a fracture propagating inside a porous medium. And you can actually show that under, uh, under gravity, uh, th this, this fracture propagates, but typically it's going to propagate horizontally, even if you start vertically. And um, I can show you more simulations. This is a, a, a small initiated crack, initia initial crack. We introduce some fluid pressure inside, and then it propagates progressively, uh, goes into existing uh, cracks which are already into the structure, and then you get exchange of fluid between the new crack and the existing crack, and so progressively you get propagation of fracture. And uh, also here we tried 3D, and we can show that uh, 3D also something is possible, but also there the stability may be disappointing. Now we go back to our experiment. Our experiment is a hydrogel with an uh, initiated crack, and uh, we simulate in finite deformation this time the propagation of the crack inside the gel, and uh, we can uh, plot uh, displacement or pressure, and we have a propagation of a crack which is definitely, as you can see, in the range of large deformations. And what we find is spontaneously that our system predicts stepwise propagation. It predicts stepwise propagation. It does not propagate the, uh, continuously, but stepwise, despite the fact that the material is strictly homogeneous. And uh, we find also that propagation length between the different teeth um, is increasing with shear modulus, which is consistent with experiment, and also the pause time is decreasing with increasing stiffness. So also there we find consistency, at least qualitatively, what, what happening, what's happening inside the gel. Now the question, why is it staccato? What happens is in poromechanics, things are kind of more complicated. In, in solid, you know, solid you have crack. Ahead of the crack, what happens is that there is, uh, the, the, the material is somehow torn apart. It, it, wants to be, it, it needs to be torn apart uh, because that is going to allow the crack to propagate. So you get the triaxial tensile state ahead of the crack. And this happens in poro mechanics also, only it is the fluid which is in the under pressure. And this under pressure attracts fluid and the fluid goes towards that point and then progressively the fluid pressure goes up again and what happens is that uh, this tensile load is transferred to the solid and then you get propagation. And again, you have the same thing happening again. 
first the fluid taking up the, the, the tensile stress and then progressively handing it over to the solid. And it's in this way, we think that we can understand what is happening inside this gel as it is propagating. So we have fluid flow towards this center and progressively we see that the effective stress is increasing. Now what you can show in, uh, in gels is that typically the propagation distance squared divided by the pulse time is the, in the order of magnitude of the pressure diffusion coefficient. What is the pressure diffusion coefficient? It is the hydraulic permeability times the stiffness. And you find, therefore, that you can assume that this, this stepwise propagation is directly associated with um, uh, fluid flow inside our gel. Now we can do also simulation of several uh, cracks uh, uh, at the same time uh, in finite deformation. And uh, you see them propagating and going inside as you would expect it to happen in a gel, but also as you would expect it to happen in an intervertebral disc. Um, and we can actually show also that without loading from outside, a gel can start cracking. Um, and this is what happens in the disc. In the disc, you, you know, you get crack propagation and you can show that different people with uh, having uh, very uh, heavy loaded spines and other which have low loaded spine, whatever happens, it's always so that crack, cracks develop inside the disc. And uh, this shows actually a simple experiment. Uh, this is a, a, a cylinder of a uh, gel, but which has been cross-linked, so it cannot stand swelling very well, so it goes in a crack. And this is actually in another view of the same uh, sample, but uh, produced by a mirror. So here you get the swelling, and what happens? It cracks into pieces. So uh, the opposite you can do as well. You can actually deswell the 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 gel, and it goes into pieces as well because it cannot stand this kind of cracks. So this is kind of idea that we can create to understand what is hydraulic, uh, what is um, um, disk degeneration uh, with time using uh, this phenomenon. But also there we are using on one hand the intervertebral disk application, on the other hand also um, uh, oil, uh, uh, oil field applications where also there it is known that um, shales, which are also swelling, can actually cause a lot of trouble to oil companies as they are drilling into the soil. Now, a completely different application, which we are seriously working on, and also using mixed hybrid finite elements, you're using Ravia Thomas elements, is a application in the science of card in the world of cardiology. In the world of cardiology there is a lot to do about simulation in 3D of the electrophysiology and the contraction of the heart. But if you think very carefully, uh, damage of uh, heart, failure of heart, is in 95% of the cases associated with fluid flow. Fluid flow uh, coronary flow inside the heart being disrupted for some reason and somehow the heart, the, 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 the blood flow cannot reach certain areas of the heart. And uh, so we want actually to integrate this complex flow phenomenon inside the heart using um, standard methods from poro mechanics in order to simulate this during contraction. This is here the system of coronary flow with the left descending coronary artery, the uh, circumf uh, circumflex uh, coronary artery, and the right coronary artery, uh, all feeding the heart from the aorta, which you see here on top. Now, 
What we can do is um, Eindhoven has a very advanced model to simulate in 3D contraction of the heart coupled to electrophysiology. And um, we take that model and we have also an axisymmetric model of a heart uh, left ventricle. And we take that model and we add to it a coronary circulation model in which we distinguish between arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. And uh, we simulate uh, blood pressure, uh, blood flow uh, during contraction. This is during end diastole and uh, ejection. We uh, are working on uh, having simulation of blood perfusion inside a beating heart so that we can do prediction as far as the effect of specific uh, cardiac uh, devices on this phenomenon. Here, this is a view of different uh, compartments inside the, the left ventricle, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and we uh, can simulate this as a function of time. This is done specifically here for end diastole but we can uh, take different times during contraction to simulate this coronary blood pressure and coronary flow in order to predict failure of the heart. This is ongoing work. And uh, as a conclusion, I would like to tell you that mixed hybrid finite elements has added value compared to normal uh, UP formulation as available in Abacus for poromechanics, particularly for la very large deformations, but also for non-homogeneous media. At low stiffness and high swelling propensity, gels exhibit surface instability. Shear modulus of gels depend both of st on strain and ionic concentration. There is evidence of staccato crack propagation in homogeneous gels. And uh, the XFAM method that we developed is able to predict the staccato for propagation of, gels in, of, of cracks in gels. Uh, multiple cracks, merging of cracks, bifurcation of cracks are within reach of XFAM simulation. And coronary circulation modeling in contracting heart may lead to virtual environment, which uh, allows us to simulate cardiac devices before launching into animal experiments and clinical trials. So I have to acknowledge uh, many people who have contributed to this work and also uh, many companies who had helped in financing all of this. So maybe there are many questions. Wow. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Thank you very much, Jacques, for this amazing talk today. So we have time for questions. <laughs> I hope that. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask about um, this change in the same fu shape functions that you mentioned. Do you also apply it in the displacement uh, degrees of freedom on or only in the fluid um, flux or pressure? Uh, uh, you should think, uh, if you think for, for solids, huh? solids, um, you write down classical equations of uh, solid deformation uh, using displacement as degree of freedom um, automatically complies with local mass balance. Why? Because you make a mesh and there are no gaps between the elements. The elements uh, stick to each other very nicely, even if they continue, de uh, de uh, uh, they, they continue deforming, they stick onto each other. So the mass balance is automatically accounted for for a solid. Um, what is not accounted for perfectly is the uh, momentum balance. Momentum balance is accounted for on the average. So there you are not perfect. For the mass balance, you are perfect in a solid. And when you add fluid, you do solid fluid simulation, you comply with mass balance for the solid perfectly, and your solid, your, 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 your uh, momentum balance is going to be accounted for on the average. But for the fluid, you did the opposite. 
because your pressure is continuous, there are no gaps in the in the, the pressure. It's not that one side of an element has another pressure than the other side. Um, but you have problems with mass balance. And the reason for doing this thing of uh, ravia toma element is to account for mass balance locally for the fluid. And the reason why we get better results is because we account for this mass balance. And it's an old trick which uh, is used standard, uh, in standard way since many years in fluid mechanics. So all the computational fluid mechanics packages account for that. But in uh, poro mechanics, we, people never minded about that. <laughs> and so when you account for that, you have a much better model, a much more stable model, and, and the, the, the computational time is same. Huh? It's not that we are doing something much more complex, because we just have the displacement and then some uh, here Lagrange multipliers, but it's basically pressure or chemical potential. It's the same thing. In size, it's, it's not that more complex, only it's a little bit more complex in programming. And we've been pushing the abacus to uh, build it into uh, their standard package. They promised us to do so, but I haven't seen anything happening yet. Usually, you should think if you give them the equations, you know, they solve it in two days' time. One employee from them can have it inside abacus. <laughs> so it's not that it's a lot of work. It's extremely rout routine in, in, in putting new, new elements into abacus. But... Uh, you know, it's, it's business, and as long as it's not clear to them they really need it, uh, then it doesn't happen. Now, there is one thing, you know, developing finite elements, the thing you need is to have companies behind you. Because we are customers of Abacus, but they give us Abacus almost for free. Because we are educational, and et cetera, et cetera, and we don't have money, et cetera. So we get it almost for free. Now, if you go to Procter & Gamble or Shell or whatever kind of big companies, they pay, I think, maybe 400, 500,000 euro per year for their subscription to Abacus. And what they have, they have people walking around in their research labs paid by Abacus. And they're just helping people. <laughs> so, what you need in order to get this kind of developments into commercial packages is have the support from these big customers. Because uh, Abacus worries about having Procter & Gamble as a customer, but they don't mind about University of Eindhoven. or, or they, 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 it's, it's of no value to them. So you need to have support from them. And one of the issues that we have when we, we really move towards biological application is that we need to have support from a multinational to, to support this. This whole thing of blood perfusion, getting into, uh, into a commercial package is one thing, but the other thing is getting it supported by the company. And you get it supported by the company only when there is a significant market for them. And you have to justify that this, this market is big enough. Now, uh, Abacus has started a, a project on living heart. Living heart. And what happened is that one of the guys from Abacus, he was manager there, and he, he, he got a daughter. And um, uh, he, this daughter had a congenital heart disease. And then he was watching on the pediatric uh, cardiologist uh, uh, studying the MRI of his daughter and, 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 and looking what he's going to do. And he was flabbergasted that this guy was going to cut into the, the body of his small baby daughter without doing any computation whatsoever. He just started cutting. Now, if you think about what we do, I came here by flight. Now, this plane which I was came, which I, with which I came uh, here and, and which many others used, uh, we are pretty sure that when we leave from Holland, we're going to arrive in, 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 in Barcelona without much trouble. Why? Because every small part of a, of a plane is calculated by means of finite elements on fracture, on failure. Every small piece is calculated everywhere. 
And therefore, we know for pretty sure that we are going to arrive uh, safely into Barcelona. Now, it is incredible that when you start working on a heart, that you have no computational tool whatsoever, one works on feeling, <laughs> starts cutting and reconnecting and things, no computation whatsoever. For failure of heart, there is no computational tool, nothing. Because it's disruption of blood perfusion, and nobody does blood perfusion in finite elements. People are used to do stresses and strains. So people are doing stresses and strains because they're used to stresses and strains. But a cardiologist doesn't know about stress and strain. He wouldn't even know the difference between stress and strain. So while he knows everything about blood perfusion, and the final element people don't know about blood perfusion. I talked about blood perfusion with the living heart people from, from uh, Abacus. They never heard about it. They don't realize it exists. They just do stresses and strain in the heart. <laughs> so there is really a problem of communication between on one hand cardiology and the other hand the engineers. And it, the, the, they talk simply a different language. They, they do different things. And that's why there is a, 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 re a real serious issue. While the reality is that there are 18 million deaths a year on cardiovascular disease. So there is a lot to do about it, much more than those planes. Because those planes, you know, uh, there are many planes in the, in, in the air. But there may be 1,000 deaths a year, a few, a few planes falling down every year, something like that. Now, you can say that's very bad. OK. But 18 million is much worse. So there, there is an urgent need for finite element analysis and comparison with experiments, prediction of what is going to happen. And it, it, it's very difficult to get it going. It's really a challenge. And uh, so we are working on it. We think that it's possible to do it. And uh, I really believe that if we continue working on it, we're going to convince the people. But how many years it will take, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. I think just a comment, that's just amazing what you've said about uh, this blood perfusion stuff. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was having a beer with a friend of mine. Uh, she's vascular surgeon at the hospital clinic here in Barcelona. Yes. And she said exactly the same thing. Say what we are lacking are model computations for blood perfusion, you know, that's, the, that's in order to improve our intervention. So I was really yes. uh, basically struck by by what you've said. Yes, yes. Such I convergence. <laughs> yes. Uh, Terence. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, just along the same lines then of blood perfusion, but going back to the disc, and um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts in relation to modic changes and the subchondral bone and the effects of um, the like hypertension in that area and the, and the pressure of blood perfusion in that area and whether that can have any uh, link or mechanical effects in terms of um, vertebral end plate disruption um, or end plate defects. Mm. I think if you think of pressure in the heart and in uh, uh, arteries, you are thinking about uh, uh, a few kilopascal. Now, if you think of pressure inside the disc, you're talking of much higher pressure. You're thinking of uh, many uh, megapascal. So uh, the order of magnitude is much different. So. If you think of what is happening at the end plate, uh, the osmotic pre-stressing and the loading on the disc is probably much more important than the pressure into the arteries. Now, what definitely can play a role is what is happening on the level of capillaries. And I think there, there is there are also huge gaps on what is exactly happening on the level of the microcirculation. I realize that microcirculation just physiologically is very poorly understood. 
And uh, it is extremely important, not only in this generation, but also for uh, diabetes. Uh, many, many um, uh, issues with uh, cardiac function and also brain is associated with microcirculation. And usually neglected for the simple reason that if you look at x-rays, you see large arteries. You can see uh, uh, um, stenosis, occlusion. Immediately you can say, well, I'm going to put a stent and the problem is solved. Now, the reality is that uh, a large part of the patients uh, don't have any stenosis or occlusion and still have problems with heart or brain function. And you cannot find any lesion and especially ladies you will complain about heart problems, they don't have lesions, not observable lesions. But on the level of microcirculation, a lot is happening, which we never see. And the, the cardiologists and the uh, spine surgeons and uh, the, the brain surgeons don't see what is actually happening. And there, there is a huge gap, I think even simply of physiologically understanding what is happening. One of the things we are researching now is, um, and that we do with microfluidics, we are um, trying to understand the following phenomenon. It is known that there is something like farus lindquist effect, namely that the red blood cells are always flowing a little bit faster than the, the, the plasma. It's a little bit faster, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. And the difference becomes more as you go to smaller blood vessels. Now, in capillaries, uh, you find that during exercise, uh, the flow in the capillaries is for red blood cells, maybe 30, 40 percent faster than uh, plasma. But if you look at the resting muscle, for some mysterious reason, suddenly this ratio becomes completely different. The, the red blood cells are going three to four times, five times faster than the, 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 the plasma. And nobody understands why. This is not just uh, convection. It's just something special happening there. And we are trying to illustrate this on, uh, on microfluidics. But this is just a very simple phenomenon which is observed everywhere in microcirculation and it's not understood. So uh, th there are things which um, need to be researched on that level and I think there is a very great need from the, uh, the, the, the clinical point of view because uh, cardiologists don't know what to do. And I think for, 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 for DISC it may be a similar issue. What's happening exactly at the interface between uh, the cartilaginous end plate and the vertebra is, is, I think, extremely important. That's one thing, and probably poorly understood, because we don't know what exactly happening. So yeah, thanks very much. Okay. <coughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I have. Well, thank you for the talk. I have a question related to the uh, fracture uh, simulations. Uh, do you think that could be possible to include in these fracture simulations hydrogels containing cells and kind of predict how these fractures can happen with cells inside the hydrogels? Oh, putting cells inside the hydrogels. As a 3D culture model, for example. Yes. I think it would be worthwhile doing because uh, I I'm, I'm, would be pretty confident that you can measure that cells sense the fracture. Uh, if you would uh, kind of uh, doing something with immunohistochemistry or whatever, uh, showing what is happening with cells directly at the crack tip, I'm pretty sure that you will find that the, the, the cells are intelligent enough to know there is some fracture there. And, um, um, and how it happens, I don't know. But um, 
we are suspecting from our side, and uh, I'm closely cooperating with someone on this subject, is that we are suspecting that piezoelectricity may be an important way. Um, streaming potential and diffusion potential and donut potential may be important as well. But uh, quite often, piezoelectricity is put aside because they say, oh, yes, it's too small, etc. We have the feeling that it might not be that it might be actually one of the methods through which the cells at a distance know that there is something happening and something has to happen, and that upregulating takes place thanks to the fact that they know, oh, there is a fracture there, or there is uh, some inflammation there, or whatever. And um, so, um, of all of the uh, mechanotransduction that we know, I think we know a lot, but I think we don't know everything. And one of the pathways we are testing is the uh, voltage gated ion, ion channels and electrical phenomena. Because electrical mechanical is so dense, uh, intimately linked in, in the extracellular matrix that we think that uh, this this line of uh, study should be explored. We can show that uh, we've shown in disk that voltage gated ion channel responds to load. That definitely, without any doubt, we have uh, clear uh, evidence that voltage gated ion channels respond to load. The pathway through which it happens uh, it happens is still unclear. But uh, I think it is worthwhile doing. The, the trouble you may have is that you cannot exactly predict where the crack is going to go. Uh, but uh, if you have a controlled experiment, yes, you could do it. Okay. Good idea. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Jack, Good. and all of you. With this, we close this session of the morning. Oh. <clears throat> and let's go eat. <laughs> Knows that you knows the compass. Well.